Coming up today, South Korea will announce the location for the U.S. missile defense system known as THAAD this afternoon. Sources say it will likely be placed in a sparsely populated county in the south of the country. The nation's jobless rate edges down in June, but the youth unemployment rate hits a June high not seen since the late 1990s. A government-led corporate restructuring drive could make matters worse in the weeks and months to come. First, the United States is pressing China to respect The Hague's rejection of its far-reaching claims to the South China Sea. It says the ruling is final and legally binding. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello, it's noon on Wednesday, the 13th of July. You're tuned in to our midday newscast here on Adidang TV. Thank you ever so much for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. We are going to start with today's huge military announcement. South Korea and the United States have reportedly agreed on a location for the deployment of the U.S. missile defense system known as THAAD. The official announcement is scheduled for this afternoon. But for now, we will connect on the phone with our defense correspondent Kim Hyun-bin who is standing by for us at the Ministry of National Defense. Hyunbin, what's the latest? Uh, good afternoon, Mark. Uh, South Korea's Defense Ministry is set to announce the location today at 3 p.m. Korea time. And sources within the South Korean military say the THAAD battery is likely to be placed in Songju County in Gyeongsangbuk-do province. Uh, Vice Defense Minister Hwang yin mu and other government and military officials are in Songju to explain the possible deployment uh, to local and provincial government officials. Now, area residents and officials have expressed strong opposition to hosting the missile defense system. Now, South Korean U.S. forces have reportedly agreed that the site is suitable for military operations. Uh, their area is also sparsely populated. Now, if deployed in Songju, that could cover an area up to southern Gyeonggi-do province, just south of Seoul. Now, South Korea and the U.S. agreed last Friday to place that in South Korea to counter North Korea's growing nuclear and ballistic missile capabilities. Now, that's all I have for now, but I have more updates and a later newscast. Thank you, Hyunbin, for that report. Now staying with THAAD and the anti-missile systems deployment is also a major talking point at the National Assembly, as you would imagine. During an ongoing review session Wednesday morning, lawmakers on the Special Committee on Budget Accounts grilled government officials over the validity of the decision and the location of the U.S. missile defense system and a number of other issues to do with the deployment as well. Lawmakers are directing their questions to government officials involved in the deployment of THAAD, including the Prime Minister and the Foreign and the Defence Ministers. The session also covers local affairs like the money spent during the April general election and allocation of a budget supplement for this year. President Park Geun-hye and Swiss President Johann Schneider Amann will sit down at the presidential office of Chong Wadae this Wednesday evening for summit talks. The two countries aim to upgrade their partnership on the creative economy by expanding practic practical cooperation in trade and investment as well as science, ICT and job training. Regional and global matters, including issues related to North Korea and Europe, and possibly the Brexit situation may also be on the table. President Schneider Amann, who is in Seoul for a two-day visit, is the first Swiss leader to visit Korea since the two countries established diplomatic ties all the way back in 1963. Now, Korea's job market showed a slight improvement in June, but the youth unemployment rate remains stubbornly high. Prospects aren't so rosy in the months to come either, especially with Korea's corporate restructuring drive likely to cast a dark cloud over the job market. Kim Minji with the details. Korea's youth jobless rate in June hit its highest point in 17 years. Statistics Korea says the unemployment rate for young people between 15 and 29 years of age stood at over 10 percent last month. It quickened from 9.7 percent in May, however, the agency cautioned against too much skepticism. Although it seems as though the youth jobless rate worsened, we must take seasonal factors into consideration. Usually the unemployment rate for that age group tends to quicken in June and July and then slows again in August. 
Overall, employment conditions showed a slight improvement in June. The country added more than 350,000 jobs last month from a year ago, bringing the total number of employed to around 26.6 million. Job growth had been slow for the previous two months, with the number of new jobs added sitting in the 200,000 range. The agency attributed the pickup to increased employment in the restaurant and accommodation sectors, which were hit hard by the MERS outbreak in summer last year. It noted, however, that the government's ongoing corporate restructuring drive could take a toll on the job market down the line, especially the manufacturing sector. The manufacturing industry added 15-thousand workers in June from a year ago, a stark contrast to the 50-thousand added on year in May. Regions where the country's shipbuilding industries are concentrated also saw their jobless rate go up in June. The agency stressed the need for the swift implementation of a pledged budget supplement worth over 8 billion U.S. dollars to tackle the downside risk the restructuring drive could bring to the job market. Kim min Arirang News. The world's two superpowers, the United States and China, are already clashing over an international panel's ruling on the South China Sea dispute. China refuses to accept it, but the U.S. says it's final and legally binding, and all related countries should abide by it. Guangzhou reports. The ruling on the South China Sea dispute is final and legally binding on both China and the Philippines. This was the U.S. reaction to the tribunal ruling in The Hague Tuesday, which brought victory to the Philippines, which filed the case three years ago, as well as other Southeast Asian countries involved in increasingly tense maritime disputes with Beijing. U.S. State Department spokesperson John Kirby said the U.S. hopes and expects that China and the Philippines will comply with their obligations. He called for all parties to refrain from provocative statements or actions, expressing hope that the ruling will be an opportunity to deal with disputes in a peaceful manner from here on. Kirby said the U.S. has persistent concerns about China's militarization of the South China Sea. We have seen some signs uh, uh, in recent weeks that some of that activity uh, continues, uh, and we have been, again, very consistent, very clear. Uh, with our Chinese counterparts uh, about uh, our ongoing concern uh, with, in, that, in that regard. Those concerns may linger, though, and even grow into bigger diplomatic rows, as China, which did not attend Tuesday's tribunal, immediately repeated its stance that it won't comply with the ruling. The Chinese government released a statement saying China was the first to, quote, discover, name, explore and exploit the South China Sea Islands and their surrounding waters. According to the UN tribunal ruling, China has no historic or economic legal basis for its expansive claim over around 90 percent of the South China Sea. South Korea's foreign ministry said Wednesday it's taking notice of the ruling and hopes that through this momentum the South China Sea dispute will be settled through peaceful and creative diplomatic efforts. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Now to the latest on the U.S. presidential election, now under four months away. Bernie Sanders has endorsed his former rival Hillary Clinton for president. In a show of party unity Tuesday, Sanders said Clinton was the best candidate to fix America's problems and best to beat Donald Trump in the November election. Park Jong hong reports. Bernie Sanders has buried the hatchet with his old foe, Hillary Clinton, and officially declared his endorsement for the presumptive Democratic nominee. Secretary Clinton has won the Democratic nominating process. And I congratulate her for that. She will be the Democratic nominee for president. And I intend to do everything I can to make certain she will be the next president of the United States. Speaking in New Hampshire, Sanders said Clinton would take up the fight to ease economic inequality, make college more affordable, and expand health care coverage for all Americans. 
In response, Clinton said it was a privilege to get Sanders' support and pitched the resounding slogan, We are stronger together. The backing by Sanders comes two weeks ahead of the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia, where Clinton will be formally nominated. Reacting to the endorsement, Donald Trump's campaign said Sanders was now officially part of the rigged system he had criticized during his long primary battle with Clinton. Park Jong-hong, Arirang News. The Bank of Korea will set the key interest rate for this month on Thursday. It will also release its new growth outlook for the Korean economy. And the governor will hold a separate session on why the country's inflation rate is running so low. Our Hwang Jie has a preview. After a surprise rate cut in June, the market consensus for this month is Korea's central bank will hold its current 1.25% key interest rate steady. As the Bank of Korea gears up for a monetary policy meeting scheduled for Thursday, analysts say the central bank has never lowered the key rate for two straight months. They add the BOK will want to take time to gauge the impact of a government stimulus package announced late last month. But when the timeline is expanded to the end of the year, there are lingering expectations for another rate trim. While the country's main growth engine exports have dropped for a year and a half, experts say several uncertainties, including the recent agreement between Korea and the U.S. to deploy an advanced missile defense system to Korea, continue to threaten the country's growth. So uncertainties in the global economy, uh, especially after the rising geopolitical tension after the Saad deployment decision with the U.S. and the South Korea exports to China and the negative sentiment among the Northeast Asian countries might negatively affect Korea trade. And with major economies like Japan gearing up for more monetary easing in the wake of Britain's decision to leave the EU, experts say it's unlikely that Korea will keep its own rate unchanged. After the Brexit, countries worldwide are heading to implement monetary easing policies like quantitative easing and lowering key rates. And that means the BOK has room to also jump into that race. Experts at the governor's separate session on the country's low inflation rate could also signal there's more room for more rate cuts down the road. As for the new growth outlook for Korea for this year, a majority of economists is expecting the BOK to revise the figure down to 2.6 percent. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, staying with economic news, an investment between South Korea and China has soared since the two countries' free trade agreement went into effect last December. According to the Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency on Wednesday, Korea's FDI in China was at 2.2 billion US dollars as of May, a 12% increase from the same period last year. The figure decreased after peaking at $6 billion in 2004 and then started gaining momentum again in 2012. China's FDI in Korea also increased sharply to $700 million as of May, an 88% jump from the same period last year. Kotra says the increasing investment is a result of more Korean firms expanding into China and more diversified Chinese investment in Korea, ranging from real estate to cultural content and food. For the first time in the United Nations history, candidates hoping to become the next UN Secretary General have been gathered together for a live televised debate on why they should be the man or woman to replace the current chief, Ban Ki-moon. Park Ji-won files this report from New York. It's a historic event that has never taken place in the UN's roughly seven-decade-long history. The UN invited the candidates running for the secretary general position to the UN headquarters General Assembly Hall on Tuesday evening to hold its first ever live internationally televised debate. Addressing a packed hall of diplomats, UN officials and journalists, as well as global viewers from around the world, the hopefuls laid out their case for why they should lead the UN at a time of multiple political, economic and humanitarian crises. Audience members fired tough questions at the candidates on diverse topics ranging from climate change, UN Security Council reforms to regional conflicts. 
The debate was live broadcast through UN Web TV and Al Jazeera. This event follows a series of two-hour dialogue sessions separately held with each candidate over the past few months. The UN says they are part of efforts to make the Secretary General's election process more transparent and open to the world. In the past, Secretary Generals were really decided and chosen behind closed doors, and no one really knew who it was going to be until a name uh, was finally emerged. Uh, but the President of the General Assembly, uh, Mons Lukatov, he wanted to make this much more open and transparent. The current UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has led the UN for almost 10 years, but his second and final term will finish at the end of this year. Currently, 12 people have officially registered for the top UN job, and sources here say the 15-member Security Council, which has the authority to select the next Secretary General, will start closely examining the candidates later this month. Park Ji-won, Arirang News, New York. Now, more stunning photographs from NASA have been beamed back to Earth. The space agency's solar-powered spacecraft, Juno, has sent back its first photos since entering Jupiter's orbit. The picture shows Jupiter's famous great red spot, as well as three of the planet's four largest moons visible from left to right. Juno took the photograph on July 10th when NASA's control towers reactivated the spacecraft's visible light Juno cam which had to be turned off for six days to reduce the exposure from Jupiter's extremely radioactive atmosphere. At that moment, Juno was 4.3 million kilometers from Jupiter. The lead scientist says that people on Earth can expect the first high-resolution image of Jupiter to be taken on August 27th, when the satellite makes its next close pass over the planet. Looking forward to seeing that photo. Well, that's pretty much all we have for now on this Wednesday lunchtime here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom. Thank you, as always, for watching. We'll be back throughout the day with more newscasts. Our next scheduled bulletin coming up at 3 p.m. Korea time. So until then, goodbye.